So you'll hear us now talk more about centers and interdisciplinary efforts than we do about departments or units or disciplines. And we're designing our programs to be that way so that we have things like a Water for Food Institute that deals with everything to do with water for agriculture, uh, both in Nebraska and globally. Center for Plant Science Innovation that is seeking to innovate technology for crops. We've had that at Cure for some time. It's quite a successful international center. It's well known. We need to develop the exact same thing for red meat innovation here and have that kind of center of excellence uh, focused in that arena. We have new programs like a gut function initiative I'll tell you a little bit about here in a minute. Uh, Gateway for Nutrigenomics, where we're designing foods to match genetic potential of people. That's the idea of nutrition for your genomic profile, if you will. A redox biology center that's so important around uh, especially immunity and a Nebraska Center for Virology. All of those being things that are, that are interdisciplinary focused around solving problems rather than deep down in a discipline. And as you'll see on the right hand side of there, we don't stop at just biology, but we also are quite interested in the social science aspects of what's going to need to be uh, in place to carry these out, both in terms of rural affairs and rural, you know, what the rural future is going to look like in Nebraska and beyond, as well as ag policy. We had a team, I am happy to report for the first time in public, find out on Friday, they had competed at USDA for a new center for ag policy. Our team won an award, a competitive award of about a million dollars for support of a center for ag and food policy from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, that is phenomenal for us as we kind of move into uh, that arena. So uh, congratulations to our econ colleagues. I'm going to go pretty quickly through these. Water for Food, you've heard a lot about. It's a tremendous program that we're putting together, and we now have the uh, first legs underneath um, from about four years of development work. I mentioned water as a critically important issue to us. We know that here in Nebraska very well. If you look globally, today about a third of the world's population is under some form of water scarcity. We expect in the next 15 years for that to double based on the patterns that we see underneath, uh, particularly groundwater resources around the world. Um, ag is responsible for 70% of water withdrawals from the resources And in Nebraska, of course, we are the leading irrigated state in acreage of any state in the U.S. Um, in irrigation water. The Doherty Foundation gave us a $50 million gift to support the development of this institute about two years ago. Uh, many of you will remember Bob Doherty, the founder of Valmont Industries, who passed away here in, in the last uh, year and a half. And it was a, a real enabler for us to be able to attract attention to this particularly important area, both in terms of research, in terms of policy development, and in terms of education. So in all three kind of mission areas, not just focused on research, but equally as focused on policy and development of policy around water um, through the, um, the Institute. This is what the result of that has been in the two years since we announced the formation of the Institute. Roberto Lenton was brought on on February 1st. I know he's been out in the state and he's talked to several groups already. I think he talked to the Farm Bureau group uh, last month after he got here. Uh, we're very pleased to have attracted Roberto. But here's an example of the kind of interest there, there is that exists in this arena. These are all agreements that we have developed or have under development in the Water for Food Institute in the last 18 months. It's phenomenal how many groups around the world want to work with our expertise in water, including places like Harvard and MIT that want to work in this global water security issue, but they don't know anything about agriculture, which we already knew, by the way. <laughs> we also are interested in this life sciences arena. I'll just mention the gut function initiative I referred to a minute ago. This is a group that has gotten quite a bit of acclaim in its short life of about the last five years. They're located in our food science department, led by Andy Benson and James Walter, Bob Hutkins, and others in that group. 
The idea here is that for the very first time in our history, technologically, where we have genome sequences now available. So we have human genome sequence available, cattle genome sequence, pig genome sequence, chicken genome sequence, etc. We also have the ability through genotyping platforms to sequence communities of organisms. So think of the gut, right? So the digestive system of a pig or the digestive system of a ruminant like a bee steer or us as people that have literally trillions of microorganisms that populate our gut. And understanding what causes those populations to develop, how they change environmentally, and whether there's a genetic predisposition to how they become populated, tells us a lot about the future, not only of animal agriculture, but of food consumption in terms of humans. So this group has gotten off the ground the last several years. They're doing tremendous work, uh, both on the human side and in the livestock side. They also are working in the food safety arena. The E. coli work that you've heard a little bit about recently is tied to this group. Uh, and some significant work they're doing around E. coli and food safety uh, in the beef arena. This is one of the papers they published about a year and a half ago in the very top scientific journal in the world called the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS. Very difficult to get a paper in that journal. Uh, most scientists are lucky to get one in their lifetime. This group has published four in that journal in the last two years. And this is one of their landmark papers that points to, in people, it looks like there is a genetic predisposition to how your gut becomes populated from infancy forward. What the mix of microorganisms might be seems to be somewhat genetically determined by your own genome, uh, which is significant when we start thinking about diabetes, coronary heart disease, and other human ailments that often get linked to food either appropriately or inappropriately. This is more often the case. I, I mentioned this social arena, and I just want to point it out to this group because I hope you will be involved in this. Coming up, uh, we have been talking now for about a year about the idea of developing a new system-wide institute at the university focused on the rural future, the future of rural regions, what is going to be uh, required for them to be successful and sustainable long-term. We have a conference that will be coming up around the development of this institute here in about two months. It will be here in Lincoln. It will be focused on fleshing this mission out across the university system and our colleagues at UNO and UNK and UNL and the Med Center. Uh, I would draw your attention to the dates here. If you haven't heard about it, it's May the 8th through the 10th. It will be at the Cornhusker uh, here in Lincoln. Uh, we expect a crowd of somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 people based upon what we're seeing in the early registrations. It went live about mid-February with registration. We scanned the world to, to come up with what we thought the top thought leaders in rural, uh, what I'll call greater rural issues, uh, were who they were. We invited the top 50 out of that group. Um, and, a, and out of about two rounds, we now have 49 of those people coming to the conference. So we're very pleased with that. And we hope that you'll engage, and some of your, the folks that you work with and represent will also engage in that conference in mid-May. Innovation Campus, I'll speak to really quickly. You've heard about this. It is tremendously exciting to see phase one now up and about to be moving dirt, so to speak. Uh, it's focused on food, fuel, and water. Uh, Dan Duncan, who many of you know, is the executive director for Innovation Campus. This is the main picture that I want to show you. You will see at the top of the slide, in the very, very top hand corner, the existing 4-H building that is being renovated as the anchor facility of Phase 1 of Innovation Campus. Connected to that will be a new facility focused on the life sciences. Some of the areas I've talked about will be represented in that building. Connected to a renovated uh, platform from the, the industrial arts facility. Where it's 17 feet off of the ground. Uh, the second story is what you see here. Off the ground will be a full set of greenhouses that will be devoted to plant science innovation research. 
uh, and will house one of the, the two in the world automated plant phenotyping laboratories that allow us to collect very detailed data uh, in a high throughput fashion for plant breeding and genetics research. We're tremendously pleased about that. Uh, this is what's being leveraged out of the $25 million of funding that the legislature gave the university uh, in the budget uh, by this past year, where $10 million of that's going into the 4-H building renovation, $15 million of that is going into the remainder of the facility along with private funding that we've raised. About $80 million in total construction that we expect to see there. Ground is moving on that starting April 1. And the, the construction uh, detail calls for us to be completed with that building by the end of 2013. So we expect to be moving in uh, here in a very short order. So we're tremendously excited about that. This is what it might look like at night. The artist renderings is it would look like an entrance to or a gateway to the innovation campus uh, that are off of Salt Creek Roadway. I love using this slide because it's, it provides a little intrigue. Everybody's asking us who are the first tenants going to be at Innovation Campus. I can tell you that we were in very advanced discussions. I was in the latest round with uh, one of the major partners on Friday. Uh, we, the first five partners for Innovation Campus are on this slide. And we will see them in that building. Um, we're hosting another one of them here with their full team, their full scientific discovery team starting Wednesday morning. So we're very pleased with what those options look like for us, and I can tell you that they are in food, fuel, and water. Uh, they're focused in those arenas. Now, I just want to quickly mention, I'm getting the signal that lunchtime is up. Um, the vet diagnostic lab that you've heard a little bit about in the legislature, uh, my, my, my night will be a long one tonight because I have 30 senators to talk to before the debate starts tomorrow on um, the appropriations bill that includes uh, appropriation out of the general fund in coming years for bonding to build this veterinary diagnostic lab facility on East Campus. A total of $50 million has been written into that appropriations bill to support the development of that facility for our livestock industries in the state, our companion animal industries in the state, as well as for human health from zoonotic disease uh, and transmission of zoonotic disease concerns. We think we're in pretty good shape with that package, but of course I think many of you will know that there's a gentleman that lives across the street from the Capitol that has a few different ideas about what priorities are for the legislature and, uh, and we're not um, in total sync on this one like we were on Innovation Campus, but deep down I think the governor also is supportive of the concept uh, here of the veterinary diagnostic lab. So the existing lab is here and the animal research facility at the top there, we're just in the tail end of renovating that entire facility, about $15 million improvement uh, for small animal research. The circle there on the, the uh, playing field, some of you will recognize the East Campus Loop that's currently an intramural playing field, is where that new facility that will look like this will be located. Um, we would hope to be able to be in the building phase of that in 2013-2014. Uh, with planning funding that would go into place this July as part of that legislative package. The legislature has put a caveat on it that we have to have $5 million of, of funding up front to leverage the state's support. Uh, we've been working to develop that and I think we will be able to manage that as well to get that in place for the coming budget year uh, to be able to start that process. 